Uh, hi, uh, welcome to our session. Uh, we are really excited to share this, this book with you. We're gonna give you an overview. Um, it's a culmination of the three of us working with districts, um, helping them navigate and transform their systems into a, a, into a, a CompSea-based system that's really driven and, and based around the, the learner itself. Um, as we're going through this learning, we we're gonna invite you to please um, post any comments or questions in the chat. Uh, we'll, as authors, we're gonna try to keep track of those and we're gonna be timely about um, co collapsing them down and giving you um, some, some feedback and some information or next steps as, as needed based on your question. Um, I'm gonna basically gonna go right now into, we'll take an opportunity to introduce each other uh, ourselves. So Karen, why don't you go first? Hi, I'm Karen Hess. Um, my background is being a classroom teacher, then a curriculum director, Title I director, then a building principal, and eventually um, becoming an assessment expert with the Center for Assessment where I learned how and then taught people how to design um, state assessments and local assessments. Um, the work on this book actually was sparked by work in districts, as Dan said. I noticed Shannon Becker is on this session. I met Shannon during a, um, a series of webinars a year ago, and it convinced me we needed this book. So that pushed me to invite my good friend Rose Colby and Dan Joseph to collaborate. And I'll pass things on to Rose. Thank you, Karen. I'm Rose Colby. And uh, as uh, Karen's uh, background was as a teacher, so was mine when I started off. I went into administration as a middle school and, and high school assistant principal and middle school principal uh, for a number of years. And uh, then um, have spent probably close to, to now 15 years working uh, in this field of competency education. So much from the very beginning of um, of uh, what we now see as, as competency education. Uh, I've worked with a number of schools and districts um, and uh, departments of education um, in many of the states. Uh, this will be my, this is our, my third book and was thrilled to um, uh, work with Karen and Dan. Uh, we seem to be working in the same space for a long period of time. So, so it only seemed natural that we just put our common thinking together and really design what we feel is a good toolkit for people to take on and use to guide, um, guide schools, guide educators, guide thinking um, as we shift from traditional to competency education. Dan. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Dan Joseph. I started off as a high school social studies teacher I was new hire, got all the students that nobody else wanted. So right out the gate, I was really uh, put into a position where I really had to uh, operate from the perspective of the student as a learner, um, covering content, social studies. Uh, went into administration because I wanted to change the world. Very fortunate to have my superintendent, Sue Gendron, who's, who's gone on to do amazing things actually uh, was commissioner of education in the state of Maine, which is where I live. Um, then became an elementary principal. It was during that elementary time I was introduced to the Reinventing Schools Coalition, where I used their framework and built a, uh, a pretty high performing community based school, uh, lots of growth indicators. Um, and that's where I met uh, Chris Sturgis. Uh, the state of Maine really held us up. We were Innovation Lab Network School. Um, and I just remember, this is my, I, this is one of my brightest days. Uh, Chris Sturgis pulled me out into the hallway after talking to some of the kids. He goes, you're doing it. You're actually doing what we talk about. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun, but that uh, um, reinventing schools offered me a position I could not say no to. So I left schools, worked for Re reinventing schools and also Marzano Research Associates. And I think the reason I'm falling, uh, as Rose, I think said very, very, uh, astutely is I was using Rose's work in terms of competency. It was, it was a vehicle for me to help bring districts along. And a lot of the work I was doing in terms of developing body of evidence for learning and assessment, I was using Karen, our, her, uh, her matrices. And, and we really found a, a, a common learning space. And I think 
the book is a culmination of those experiences. And I hope that you enjoy them and find them to be a worthwhile toolkit for you. Uh, today for our webinar, we have a little bit of time, um, but we want to we want to do three things. We want you to kind of reflect on these five components that we're looking at. And these are born out of Rose's design, the architecture, the new architecture of schooling. So we want to really we're going to give you a, a look at those five components and really look at their interrelatedness. And we want you to consider how you can create equitable, student-centered, and sustainable shifts. Uh, we're not talking about layering things on top of each other, but we're really talking about how, and you'll see we use gears a lot. How does one gear affect and drive the other gears? And that's when we talk about a systemic, sustainable shift. But our eye is on the learner and equity. Um, and then we're hoping as you go through this learning, you'll be able to examine how this competency-based framework can help you identify where you are on your journey, maybe your next steps for your journey, or maybe use a tool to help dig in and find out where you are on your journey or the just right tool to move forward on that journey. Um, and all of the, when I say journey, we're really talking about meeting students where they are and helping them get to, to where they need to go. And I, I'm gonna pass it over to Rose, who's gonna kind of walk us through those five core components. Okay. Um, as we look at, at uh, we use uh, the notion of, of gears working together. And, and so often uh, when you think about what we need to do to, to move from where we are, um, you think of, of just kind of one thing, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna do this, right? But it's been our experience that um, one thing is connected to another in a lot of different ways. And when, when all of these pieces work together, that's how you really get to deeper learning where kids really experience growth, not only in their academics, but also um, in their, what we call a, their personal success skills. Um, and so the, the five kind of anchors to this work, um, first off the competencies, we really look at competencies as broadly stated academic goals, bigger than standards. Um, consider them as clusters of standards together, if you will. Um, take those academic pieces um, together with personal success skills um, that are, these two pieces have to be uh, measured and they have to be rigorous and they have to be transferable learning from content to applied content from uh, recognizing who I am as a, a learner and self-directing and, and growing in that self-direction over time. Uh, really to empower the students so that as they grow in their learning that they're going to learn beyond one single lesson or one unit and they're actually going to own their learning and, um, and, and through agency direct their learning in the future. So competencies are one piece. Those personal success skills uh, we know are, are so important. We see the work today around uh, at the state level, at the school level or district level, um, folks doing work on the portrait of the graduate. Well, if this is your graduate, and, and oftentimes I've, I've looked at many, many profiles and very rarely do I see a grade B in English as, as one of the aspirations upon graduation. But whatever we recognize within our communities as who our graduates are, we not only must teach, but we also must assess the growth in that learning over time. And this is really a big structural piece, especially in the area of, of, those, uh, of those life skill areas. Uh, we say they're important and we just assume that kids are going to get it or do it um, or learn how to do it on their own. And we have to be very intentional about our uh, responsibility for teaching and, um, and also having the student assess those skills as part of their goal setting um, in the K through 12. Um, an important piece, uh, th th that's the two pieces together, uh, competencies and success skills. And then we move on to, well, if um, competencies are about showing what you know, then, then that's performance assessment, performance is doing. And if they're doing, um, then what does that high quality assessment look like? How are we measuring that transfer of knowledge? It isn't enough to just say, do you know it or don't you know it? We really have to create rich tasks that call on those personal success skills as well as, um, as the content that we want them to learn um, and really de devise some complex uh, skills out of that so that there, we can measure um, and in so measuring, create a body of evidence. And that's where grading systems uh, come into this. 
Um, we always say, don't start with the grading. Uh, look, look at the architecture of what you need to do um, in the system. You have to have good competencies in order to measure them. You have to recognize what the skills are, uh, personal skills are, in order to, to really gain evidence for growth over time. So scoring and reporting based on a body of evidence reflects mastery of unit course and graduation competencies. And building that body of evidence is really what transforms a grading system. Finally, the learning pathways. Um, th this is how students will develop and demonstrate deeper, broader, and more sophisticated understanding over time with flexible pacing of learning. And this is really one of the, the real struggles um, in moving from traditional to, um, to competency education pathways. It's that pacing piece, how to get to the flexible pacing as part of the structure of our schools. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, Jan, you want to go ahead to the next Thank you. What we did uh, to help as a, a, a tool, um, and we've all used these, these tools in the work that we've been doing with our districts. Uh, prior to the publication of the book, we used our, our work with, with teachers to refine these tools. Um, and what we really did is we took those, those five components that you just saw um, and said, you, where, where would you be? Um, in any one of those five core components? And that's what the purpose of this readiness tool is. Um, uh, and you can use it, the tools um, alone. You can use it as a, a leadership group. You can use it as educator um, engagement pieces. But we really look at, and this is where the systems approach to CBE comes in. We used those five areas and said there's really five focus areas within that. Um, you just can't look at academic competencies just as academic competencies in a curriculum issue. Really to move your current system, there's a leadership component to that, all right? Um, there's also an instruction and assessment component to that. Every single one of these has that. The other part that we felt was really important in, in, in shifting uh, is uh, the shifts in culture, all right? Um, the learner culture. Uh, the traditional system is, is so uh, dependent upon the, um, the teacher uh, teaching the student and they are, they, it's not concentrated on, on the learner. Most of our traditional systems are based on the adults in the system, let's face it, okay? Um, I'm not saying that everywhere, but you, you know what, what I mean when I say those, those older traditional systems. And finally, the organizational structure. Um, and if you just think about how you're gonna, students are gonna pace differently, it really speaks to really thinking through how your, your organization is structured to support that, um, that and many other different pieces. So we use those, those four focus areas in each one of, of our readiness tools. And we've recognized in our work that um, we have many schools um, that are in the initiating stages of that. We have uh, schools that are in the emerging stages. And then finally, those that are really in the implementation phase of the work. Um, and sometimes you don't know where you are until you actually work these readiness tools through, but it gives you the opportunity to say, oh, we're doing pretty well with this, but look at, we're just initiating with this. We need to pay some attention with this, or gosh, I never even thought about the leadership implications for thinking through a change in the area of performance assessment, okay? So all of these pieces are part of, of the work that, that, um, that are, is part of the toolkit um, that's available to you uh, as you do this work. Um, here's an example of one. Um, and um, this is the one on competencies. Um, as you can see, uh, the component is to develop a continuum of rigorous competencies. And um, it really asks you for each one of those focus areas to ask, what are you, where is your school now? And you have to be honest with yourselves about where you actually are and then what are your possible next steps. Um, as you move through these different readiness tools, you can go back to these pieces and prioritize the next steps that you want to take. Karen? Sure. So um, before I speak to this readiness tool, which is about performance assessment, I did notice a question I'd like to quickly respond to, Okay. Uh, which was about the professional learning to change the culture mm, okay, go ahead. and teacher competencies. And we've used these tools to uncover some of the areas uh, that teachers feel they need support in learning. Mm -hmm. uh, in, per in performance assessment, a lot of people think they're doing it. <laughs> but when you have 
competencies describing deeper learning and professional and um, personal skills of students, suddenly you have to go back and say, well, how do we design these tasks? So in the performance assessment readiness tool, some of the things we speak to are, are you um, designing assessment based on standards or have you moved to broader competencies uh, addressing multiple standards? Are you engaging students in the design or are you still having teachers design? So as soon as you move from initiating to emerging, things will come up where teachers will say, that sounds, I've had teachers say, that sounds like a great idea, Karen, but I don't know how to do it. So we've tried to walk through in each of the chapters, how would you design the performance assessment? How would you integrate some of those personal success skills? How do you build the body of evidence? And um, we also address some of the teacher competencies that could be part of a teacher's personal uh, learning goals um, through this journey. And then we'll go to one more sample tool that Dan's going to describe. Yeah, so basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk how, how we would use a tool like this. Um, and I'll give you an ex uh, two examples. Uh, they're very similar. Um, typically, the, the component that I'm focusing on for, to share with you is learning pathways. And a lot of times, this is, this is the connective tissue. It's as you have organizations going through these, when they get to learning pathways, it's kind of where everything starts to, to really connect. And what it says is competencies drive rigorous, transparent, flexible system of learning in which students are empowered by opportunities to choose what and how they learn. We're talking about pace, we're talking about letting go, we're talking about agency, we're talking about independent learning, we're talking about schedules. It's really where in a lot of cases, I think systems, the rubber hits the road. So the example that I'm gonna give you is, I've done some work in, in Maine and in Michigan. And the, and the focus of that work is breaking down the silos between traditional high school courses and the CTE courses and really trying to integrate the two of them and create these integrated pathways. And the way this would work, and it kind of speaks to what Karen was just talking about is, I would go in and have leaders, teachers, I would have various focus groups, student fo focus groups, to really undergird and get some more granular data to inform where they are in those phases. But I will tell you, um, the perfect example was we had a learning walk in Michigan and there was a student in a Ford quality lab. It was Woodshop. They called it the Ford quality lab. And he was doing Pythagorean theorem. But he told, like, when I interviewed him, the superintendent and all the leaders were there, this student said he hated math. He wasn't very good at it. <laughs> but he wasn't really aware that he was uh, using a core mathematical practice as well as a, um, as well as a strategy to determine if he had a quality product, meaning it had right angles. And that, that's just kind of a glimpse into the pathway. And you think about academies and think about career ladders. All of those need to be predicated on those solid competencies, those true competencies that are really at that higher level thinking. So no matter what four math courses student A, B, or C takes, depending on their career ladder, they're still demonstrating a deeper level of those core mathematical practices. And it's, it, this is where I think people start to see the value and the, I don't want to even say magic because there's intention behind it, of that competency-based structure. And this is where I think any district looking to provide equity of access, um, this is really a, an excellent tool to help them identify where are those areas that we need to focus in to really bring about equity of access to learning for all of our students. So, and now I believe Rose. No, I think Karen's. Karen, I'm sorry. <laughs> My note page is My gone. turn. <laughs> so again, we show you our gears. Um, because there is that interrelatedness. And just one example, you, you can see, this is an overview of the book. So in the chapter on organizational shifts, we talk about professional learning, professional culture, and suggestions and examples for that. 
in the uh, teaching and learning structures, you can see um, the uh, topics covered for that and then the student-centered classrooms. But for example, if you decided we're going to use performance assessments, well, you have to go back and say, do we have a policy about how we use these assessments? Do we have professional development to help teachers know how to design, not only design, but give each other feedback? Because we've learned that the collaborative process is very powerful, it builds the culture. And then how, does, how do we give feedback on those assessments? Um, I'll speak to it a little bit more in a, in a slide that's coming up, but the idea of building a series of assessments that become increasingly complex so that when they get to that performance task, we know they're ready for it. And this is done through performance scales. So anything you would decide to do really has related decisions to be made. And um, we could give you dozens of them. We tried to provide a lot in the book of just how different schools uh, build their body of evidence, for example, or design that student-friendly pathway so students can track their own progress. And now Rose is going to go into a little bit more depth on the organizational yeah. shifts. Um, I, one of the, I think one of the, the pieces that um, in, in working, you know, um, in school districts of all different sizes um, and all different kind of political um, organ, organizations, uh, some, you know, maybe the governance may be through a, a city uh, council where another might be a, a rural school district made up of several towns together. So, so all different kinds of combinations of, of, of different um, uh, governance, if you will. But um, we really look at the, the, that shift from traditional to CVE as really those three main shifts that Karen just outlined. Um, the first one being the organizational shift. And I often think that we overlook this one uh, because the organizational kind of backbone of our schools is really hardwired in there and hasn't changed much over a very long period of time. And we often don't see it for what it is. Oftentimes, uh, many of those things that are sitting deep in the DNA code of your of your system are actually barriers to your moving forward. And uh, so one of the dimensions is, is really policy. Uh, I mean, it's great if you're going to go ahead and, um, and have students, uh, and we've seen this as we've moved to the, the COVID time, the, um, if you have policies that are based on attendance, right, um, then um, you may have a problem. Uh, having students, you know, move at their own pace or have students doing community-based work where they're not coming into school, okay, to check in. We're finding schools today that are requiring um, kids who are, on re who are on remote learning to be present every day, all day on screen in order to get credit for courses. These are the real challenges and, and moving into the, the, these last uh, several months of moving our school districts before they're ready to, that's an example of you know, not making way in the policy level for um, that which would be most successful for the kids. Right, so, uh, so policy becomes a big piece to this um, and the leadership piece also. All right, um, if you're in a top-down leadership mode um, and you're asking teachers to do the work, um, but you yourself as leaders aren't engaged with your teachers in doing this work, kind of flattening your organization and your leadership model, um, you may find it difficult to move your district forward. Um, the districts that remain top down with that superintendent that has this great idea to move towards CBE um, and isn't engaging in, in changing their leadership model and shifting it, uh, most likely will take whatever he or she has done in the district with, with him or her when, when they leave. Um, and the district reverts back to its, its, its DNA code, right? So, uh, it, it calls on all of us to really create a different professional culture, right? Um, and how we work as professionals in the teaching and learning uh, practice of our profession. Uh, and really that other piece of the professional learning, we can no longer be, and uh, again, these last six months have taught us, you can't, you can't uh, you know, corral our teachers together, sit them down, train them up and have them walk out and, and do differently. Uh, professional learning is really learning 
and developing expertise over time, okay, um, by doing the work. And so the work in moving and shifting is very iterative. You don't take big, big leaps in a single bound. You, you take small pieces of it, you do the work, you reflect, you think about the results of the actions that you've taken and that's action research really. And you say, what would the next piece look like? Let's try this, okay? But we have to empower our teachers to make those decisions um, because they are, are the ones with the expertise in teaching and learning. Um, and, and this is how we move our professional staff forward. I think a, a, the, uh, and as your morning session really um, has pointed to the really underlying piece to all of this work, all right, in these systemic shifts um, is always the, the, um, the eye on equity. And if you move to the next um, slide, Dan, um, I, we really use the design for equity as the basis for um, much of our work. And um, I think one of the um, one of the ways that um, I just want to get rid of my chat box over here. Um, here's how I view equity, um, and I, I view it as our duty as educators to ensure that each child is successful in their learning. Okay, um, we we use a little asterisk. Whatever it takes. Okay, you just you can't say, well, oh, that sounds good, but or oh, that would be fine, but. It's whatever it takes in supporting a child in their learning. And I look at it through three, three venues. One is access to it, all right? Again, these last few months have really challenged us to maybe think in, a, in, in a very real terms about access. How do we access kids to their learning when they're not sitting in front of us? And all of the barriers that, that arose from that particular set of circumstances. We actually had in regular traditional learning, Acts, uh, barriers to access while they were in our classroom, okay? Um, the opportunities that they have. Um, and, and we now can expand different opportunities, but sometimes that uh, the state testing that was in place may have been a barrier to opening up our opportunity for learning because teachers felt under that, um, that uh, oppressive need to follow the curriculums because the kids are going to be tested. Well, if kids, can't be successful in the learning opportunities that they're in, they, we have to make different opportunities available for them to be successful. And as Dan pointed out, this really requires different pathways to success for different kids, all right? Um, and so I, I view that as in three very distinct ways. And I think if you can you know, simplify, if you will, equity to think of how, do kids have, have equal, equal access to uh, the learning opportunity? various kinds of opportunities in which they can be successful and then creating different pathways along the way leading towards graduation. Okay, Dan, if we go to the next one. Um, so um, there's, um, there's drivers for this, all right? Um, and if, you, if you, you're, you encounter a problem or a barrier, you have to think through four different things in approaching the, how to solve the problem, how to overcome the barrier. The first one is time. And it usually is always time is the first one. I don't have time to do that. Um, instead of asking the question, how are you going to use time differently than you currently do? Um, don't try to fix the schedules that you have now because many of your schedules are based on adult driven decisions for why that schedule is there. But to build schedules based on time that students need to learn, okay? Talent, how do you use your talent differently? Uh, we have schools that broke open that talent barrier by saying, oh, we only have three teachers at a grade level. How can we do this? We don't have enough teachers. And we said, well, how, how are you using the talent that you do have? And maybe you can use that talent differently. What if you had grade spans for your curriculum instead of grade levels? and you were able to use the talent across several grade levels to group kids differently across your curriculum span. That's a different way to use talent, okay? Your technology, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but I think you, you understand how we have had to use technology differently and maybe in some cases introduce technology for both teachers and kids who had not had the experience of using it in their classroom before. All right, and finally, the resources and resources can be the um, can be the books, if you will, the textbooks or 
you know, resources um, can also be the financial resources that your schools need to operate. Um, resources that you need to tap into resources in your community, for example, are oftentimes overlooked. So these are the real drivers. So as you look at making the shifts, you ask yourself, are we taking an equi equitable approach? And then what's going to drive the change, that shift that's gonna move us forward? And these are the four areas that you should spend some time looking at. Um, and uh, we're gonna stop right now, okay? And we're gonna ask you to take a little time for reflection, okay? Um, and what we really wanna um, be asking, asking you is, um, do you see a logical entry point in your organization to address your systemic shifts to CBE? Uh, we're gonna have you go into breakout rooms. And as you are in your breakout rooms, we're gonna ask you to submit any questions that arise out of your breakout room uh, and, and submit those questions into the chat. And what we'll do is we'll uh, be looking at the chat and we will address those questions um, either within the context of the, the rest of the session or at the end of the session. But the questions have to go into the chat after you come back. Yes, don't take the time in, in your breakout session to, to type into the chat. Um, when you come back in uh, to the full session, uh, add your chat then, chat questions then. Thank right. you, Karen. We'll give you two minutes to talk or converse, chat.
as you come back to the main session, if you have any questions or comments that were generated, please feel free to put them in the chat. Hi, Gail. <laughs> nice to see some good friends joining us. Okay, it looks like everyone should be back now. And we need Dan to um, take over again with the slides. They, uh, you are all set, Karen. I oh, Well, actually, do we I you can't share see your them. screen. He's got to oh, share your screen. Okay, hold on. I got to get my <laughs> Zoom box. He just doesn't know how to share. <laughs> hold on. Here we go. I'm sorry. Came out of the Zoom room. Okay, great. There we go. So as as we uh, move through the um, the next slides, if anything came up, uh, we heard uh, we had a good discussion in our small group. Um, and you might have had some good discussions as well. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll try to address them at the end. And now we'll move on to a second focus area. And that's the teaching and learning shifts. And um, here, here are some areas that may push a little bit on what some schools just starting out have been thinking about is that not only do you need to have academic competencies, thinking about science or social studies or ELA or math or the arts, but what are those personal success skills? So one of the conversations we were having was about um, uh, the profile of the graduate doesn't just describe what students can do academically, but those skills that will take them into um, life after high school and help them to be successful. And in designing those competencies, we see a lot of checklists. So if you have a checklist, you don't need performance assessments. You just need a pencil and you can check things off the list. So the idea of performance assessments means that there can be a range, there can be small, introductory tasks that build to larger tasks. Uh, Grant Wiggins used to talk about the difference between going to practice and doing the drills. Those are performance tasks. You learn to dribble, you learn to shoot. And there's also playing the game, which is a much more complex task where you integrate those skills. And so as we break down our academic competencies, build in our personal success skills, then we think about how could these be assessed? And this is where we provide access and opportunity because all students don't need the same identical assessments, but they need comparable assessments. Assessments um, looking at demonstration of similar skills, maybe in very different ways before we get to the grading and reporting. And if we go to the next. So, most curriculum, I was a curriculum director. I worked in several districts where we built curriculum by grade level. And as Rose was saying, if we just thought of how does the curriculum grow over time? And if we would admit that not all kids in first grade or third grade or seventh grade are really at the same grade level intellectually, there's a progression and if we could consider where our learners are and we built our curriculum so that it builds on earlier learning, then a pre-assessment would help us to know what kind of support students get. It's a different view. It's not that they are behind. <laughs> it's not that we should be looking at learners as a deficit model of learning, 
we should be saying, where are you on the progression? And so what we've tried to do throughout the book is to show how there could be mini progressions that go for a week where students are seeing progress, or they could uh, span a, lar a longer length of time. What's interesting in the research, and I talked about this in my assessment toolkit, is kids are motivated to move ahead and make progress because they can see that they are making progress. They can look at pieces of work and say, here is where I am now and I know how to move ahead. So this idea of the progression is very powerful uh, for students to understand and give them some control. And if we go to the next slide, Stan. So as we think about what is this range of performance assessments? Well, there are those short cycle within the classroom diagnostic tasks that tell you are students ready to move on? Now we always hear this phrase in competency-based education, they're ready to move on. But we often are just thinking of the summative assessment. You take the end of uh, chapter test and you're ready to move on. But we're talking about a range of performance assessments. If you do many short cycle diagnostic tasks, group tasks, individual tasks, you build those skills so that you can build them into a course or a unit and they are used uniformly. Often they're called common performance tasks because all fourth graders might be um, doing that task. But these are performance tasks embedded in instruction. So it's not a surprise to kids, they are ready to do it. But we move from there, a lot of schools are using problem-based learning and then perhaps extended um, learning opportunities or internships. So if you are landing on one of these steps, you have to think back <laughs> to the beginning of this continuum. How are we building the skills in isolation and then in shorter tasks and maybe group tasks and scaffolded tasks so that students can do more and more of these more complex uh, problem problem-based learning, project-based learning tasks. Uh, often teachers will say, again, I don't know how to get my kids there. But if you take the task you'd like them to be able to do and step it back to a more simple model of how will we get started, some kids might be able to skip over some steps. Other ones might need some extra help. So this idea of a performance assessment continuum can be very powerful and what we suggest is once you know what the range of assessments are possible, then you can build what we call a performance scale. So if students are only doing really well on those short cycle diagnostic tasks, they have to understand that doing well on those tasks is not going to get them the A, or it's not going to be enough to say, I have uh, met the expectations for competency. And if we can go to the next slide. So this visual kind of describes how we might put this together. We have a lot of daily learning targets. And Dan, if you could click that list. So daily learning targets take pieces of the competencies. Maybe you're modeling what goal setting looks like as a personal success skill, or maybe you are breaking down um, some mathematics concepts, or you're actually teaching your students how to build a mathematical argument through some kind of an interactive activity. These daily learning targets are going to be assessed formally um, before you decide how you're going to put them together and build your summative assessments. And then if we could click again, now your summative assessments may be assessing more than one competency they can take many different forms and many different formats. And often students might be suggesting pieces of how they might be assessed. The power of personal reflection on what, the, what a student has learned is something that we can't even design what students might come up with. So we have to open the door a little bit wider to say, what what are some ways you might be able to show me what you know? And this sort of starts to leak into that personalization piece. How well students do on these summative assessments is going to determine whether or not they have 
uh, shown evidence of a comp of meeting a competency, and it's going to be multiple times, not once. Uh, the example, one example used in the book is just because your team wins one game doesn't mean they're going to win every game. What is the consistency of performance? And then we move from that to the body of evidence. The body of evidence doesn't include every summative assessment. It includes what's most important to look at when you're determining um, whether students have met multiple competencies. This requires a huge discussion with your staff. How many pieces of evidence is sufficient evidence? Um, have we designed rubrics that really qualitatively examine the evidence, not quantitative, but qualitatively. And so building the body of evidence says that this is, grading is very different. As you can imagine, we use evidence-based grading as opposed to grading each piece of work. We say, where is the evidence? If the evidence is all in the daily learning targets, then students need scaffolding to move to those summative assessments and be successful. And out of the summative assessments, how, how much evidence is needed and what's the best, most consistent look at what students are able to do. So this is big. These are fabulous discussions, um, not easy discussions to have, but you build rules around the body of evidence and how teams of educators will look at the evidence within a course and across um, school-wide um, skills that are listed in your Profile the graduate. And we will go to the next slide. And now we're not going to send you to a chat room, but we'd like to give you a little bit of time to chew on some of the pieces that we've um, discussed here um, the range of performance tasks, building a performance scale, performance assessments. What are some of the challenges you're faced with? We're gonna give about two minutes to put any comments or questions in the chat that we can respond to. My clock says 3.04, so two minutes. I'm, I'm reading a question um, about the gears. So I'm gonna to respond to that while people are thinking. So the question in the chat box was, what, what if one gear tries to move and the other gears get stuck in place? Not what if, it's probably <laughs> when, when this happens. Because we know from our experience, you're trying to move something forward and the gears are getting stuck. So, um, when we were in the first chat, we were talking about piloting, sometimes piloting ideas with a smaller group to find out if it can be successful or how it can be successful is a good way to branch off. That's one opportunity. And I know we often suggest um, set a short term goal, something you feel you can be successful at while you're working on your long-term goal. So different groups might be working on small pieces, kind of doing the action research. And what my experience has been when a group of teachers can say, we've been trying this, actually there's a, a group I've been working with in New Hampshire and they've, I've worked with them to design uh, self-direction rubrics. How do you teach kids about self-direction skills? How do you collect evidence? So this smaller cadre of social studies teachers, middle school and high school teachers are trying it out in their classrooms so that they can share what's working, what's not working before it's rolled out school-wide. And so uh, actually there, we're gonna do a session on that on Wednesday. Uh, you might find that interesting, but that started with smaller pilots, the people who are the early adapters, um, who are willing to kind of think outside of the box. 
the other uh, Karen, just the other thing when one gear is stuck and you're trying to figure out, well, one wants to move and the others are in the way. I, from my experience using that, the, the readiness tool, just going in and having leaders reflect honestly on where they are within each one of those components and within each one of those levels. For example, competencies, leadership may, may have something in place, but teachers or students are not there yet. Or teachers are stuck because leadership has not created or changed the policy. Mm -hmm. the, the, the readiness tool allows you to really dig deep and diagnose within your system what may be an opportunity and what may be a challenge. What's an entry point and what's a block. And hopefully the, with the scale, if there's a block, you'll have a goal to look at that next step. And then really everything Karen just said would be intentional, an ad hoc group or an ad uh, research group. That's, that's, I think the readiness tool itself can help. And that's the reason we developed it was we walk into these schools and all schools are different. There's no one size fits all solution, but we know there's an interrelationship between these components that help them move forward. I hope that helps. Right. Well, the other thing that tool does is it, it frames the discussion. So you're not just saying, I don't want to do this <laughs> or how do we do this? At least it provides some kind of a benchmark if we're doing this, what would be the next stage of it? And um, I noticed another comment that um, Gail posted is uh, distance learning has really cracked open a lot of these um, older practices. Um, I attended a lot of webinars about grading with distance learning and I keep coming back to create the performance scale and if students are performing at a certain level on the scale, that's how you interpret the grade. Where is the evidence? As a, as a CTE teacher in a Concord Regional Technical School told his students, you can be a rock star at that first level, <laughs> but that's not gonna get you an A. You have to move to the next level. Not only do you need to change a tire and change the oil, but you have to diagnose the problems and successfully address them. That's what moves you up the scale. Yeah, I, I also have a little bit of advice around that piece, a, a little reckoning here. Um, you know, it really doesn't make any difference where a student is learning. It, that shouldn't yeah. affect your grading system at all. Right. So whether they're learning in front of you or they're learning, you know, across, the, what it really calls on you to do is to say, were our grading practices good when they were sitting in front of us? Where they learn is irrelevant to your grading. Just think about that. Yeah. There's a the clinging to old practices. I, I think we should address that. Do you want to put that one at the end, Karen? Yeah, sure. Because I think that's a really that's actually a good learning one to pathways too. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to do. Go this. ahead. Yeah. So why don't you go to that that last section, Dan? Yeah. I go, I go last and they eat up all the time. So, uh, so really the final focus area is, the, is, is really the student-centered classroom shifts. Um, and I would say COVID, uh, the COVID disruption really has elevated this, uh, this focus area. Um, and, and just really quick, I, I, I believe the best way to, to capture this focus area is to think about an adult-driven or teacher content driven system and really just shifting it so that it's student focused student owned um, and that requires us to to embrace pace and let go of grades are you on pace and that's really what karen was just was just discussing and that's a that's a shift i also think it's um looking at core instruction uh with intentionality um and focusing on uh, relevant rigor and relevance. And when I say rigor, making sure that the just right instruction opportunities are there for those students. So that's really looking at the scaffolding and building up to, you can see how this really feeds back into that assessment. And that's why I'm going to go a little bit deep on how we use feedback um, to really engage the learner uh, into the process of learning. It's not an event that happens outside of them or happens to them. It's one that we invite them to be a part of. And that's why I, we try, I try to just have teachers understand assessing is not something you do to a student. It's something you invite a student to show me evidence of your learning. 
And it really puts you on a different ground and a different mindset as to how we generate and collect valid, reliable evidences for learning. And that's really the, the body of evidence. And I, and, I, and I hope as you get to that clarity, you can, think, you can see student supports and equity. It, it's not enough to wait to the end of the learning cycle to provide that, that targeted instruction to accelerate learning, because that's, that's the struggle the teacher has. I want to move on and these kids aren't there yet. So how do we help teachers engage students throughout the process with that assessment feedback? So that the second they're off pace, the student knows it and the teacher knows it. And they can start identifying goals and strategies to accelerate that learning. Target instruction plus time accelerates learning. And all of these really invite a different role for the teacher, a different role for learners, um, and a different role of learning. And that's really what that cl classroom culture and engagement is all about. So when you talk about student efficacy and student agency, it's through intent and it's through design. Uh, and that's kind of what, what, this whole, what this whole focus area is about. I think it's, I think it's the most important, it's the instruction. Assessment's nice, Karen, but. Um, so basically I just wanted to, this slide right here is just to really help you understand the scope of the book and how the book is designed. As we're walking through these focus areas and these shifts and these components, we're trying to elevate um, strategies and practices that are, that, are, that are considered high leverage or high yield strategies in Hattie's work. Um, and, and really you can see the role of the student and you can see the role of design and intentionality of the teacher. And it's really, it's, really, um, it's, a, it's fertile ground if you're talking about visible learning and you want to put that into action, uh, competency based frameworks and structures can really provide fertile ground for building that system and placing students in it uh, to, to enhance learning opportunities. Uh, I want to go to that, just going to the next level down. When we think about that visible learning, we also need to be thinking about the role of the learner. And I like to think of a goal without a strategy is a wish or a dream. So if our goal is to make sure kids are more engaged, we need to activate and identify those strategies to do just that. And there's four areas of strategies that, that really are levels for engagement, equity, and mastery. And, and I like to show teachers this slide and have themselves rate themselves. And you're gonna, as I read through these really quick, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go too, too deep into them, but you can see where there, there really isn't important. If we're talking about letting go and having students set pace, or we're talking about multi-level classrooms where your birthday doesn't determine what class you're in, but where you are in your learning, you're gonna think about these four strategies as, as, an, as a, an important consideration in designing that type of learning. Cognitive strategies, most teachers do well. Can you unpack a standard? Do you understand the rigor? And this is really, I won't go too deep in it. Karen really just discussed this those cognitive strategies. But the metacognitive strategies are, are incredibly important because they activate the self system and the, uh, the levels of engagement. Can they think about their thinking? As we're teaching, are we elevating the thought process required? Because you want to engage a student, not give them the answer, but give them a redirection so they can find the answer. Error correction is very important. So those, those metacognitive strategies need to be part of our instruction. Motivational strategies, self-efficacy and self-regulation. I have to believe teachers are really trying to activate and ac help students access these strategies in a distance learning format. How are they, do they see the value in the work? Are they able to pace themselves? Do they understand, do they have the perseverance? Do they have the, the wherewithal to continue engaging in a learning process? And believe it or not, a big part of that is do they understand learning as a process and do they see feedback as an opportunity for improvement? That's a system that we have got to change. Students don't necessarily adopt that philosophy because of, of many of our approaches in, in grading um, and schooling. And the last one is management strategies, finding, navigating, and evaluating resources. If we're going to let go of the, of the learning and have students be leaders in their learning, we need to make sure they have those management strategies, understanding where they are, what do they need to do um, to move themselves forward. 
So those are kind of, those are the strategies you want to be thinking of. Um, and, and really all of those strategies kind of fall under metacognition, reflection and goal setting. And when we talk about a student-centered classroom, these are, these are the, the self, uh, the, um, the skills that we want, the interpersonal or personal success skills. We want students to not just possess, but we want to continue to instruct and give them feedback on them. So as we're going through the learning process, we want students to know where they're going. They want to know what they need for the journey. They want to know where they are in their journey, but they also want to know when I got there, what's next. So they're always moving forward. Um, and all of these high leverage um, strategies by Hattie are all encompassed in this. And what Hattie calls uh, visible assessors, uh, that's really what we're trying to look at. I just wanna go a little bit deeper in that. I wanna make sure we have enough time to do questions. But he calls them assessment capable visible learners. And, and I think it's important for us to embrace and understand and teach. I think most teachers understand the idea and the value of growth mindset feedback. But there's also feedback in four different areas. The task level is, is typically uh, your corrective feedback. I think most of us know, and that's where we say you want to have, you know, don't give feedback, give feedback on the process, not necessarily the, the outcome. And it, and it basically, we want them to think about where they are in relationship to the su success criteria you've put out for them. That's your task level. I think most, most teachers are comfortable with that. Process level is, is really giving feedback on their thinking or their use of a thought process. It's really getting them to be metacognitive, um, to understand learning from mistakes. What, what did you do? What could you do differently? And you're teaching them opportunities for self-teaching, for self-correction, because we know that, that that actually deepens their learning. And all of that promotes self-efficacy. The next one is self-regulation. And self-regulation is for them to evaluate themselves based on where they are in the progression. And it's not to say that you didn't get it, you're, you're not. They need to understand where they are in their learning so they can access resources, ask for help, but also as the teacher, that's valuable instructional feedback so you can do just right instruction. And that goes back to that progression of assessments. There's also a progression of learning, that scaffold of learning, that transparency and having students understand where they are. I will tell you, if it, when done correctly and feedback is used timely and targeted, students will get feedback and that will create a greater sense of ownership and engagement. They will want to work harder because they know where they're going. And that whole idea of self-regulation is based on us giving them that feedback as part of the learning process. And the last one is the self-level. And this is the one that's a slippery slope. You just want to make sure that you're keeping praise um, separate from the learning feedback. You know, basically proud of you working hard to solve that problem or, you know, let's have a celebration. But I definitely want students to feel good. We want students to feel good about themselves uh, throughout the learning process, not feel defeated, but feel supported and understanding where they are in relation to where they need to be. All of these things are, are important in terms of substantive, timely feedback. And that's where the competencies, the personal success skills, and the performance assessments and pathways all come together and make it more student-facing and student-owned. So that's, that's what we want to think about. So as we, as, we, as we think about letting go and having students step up and own uh, their learning process in a more intentional way, uh, our question for you is, what are the greatest challenges and opportunities um, to make these systemic shifts in creating personalized pathways uh, for learning. And it's, and it's letting go and having the other side uh, pick up that ownership. So, and I believe... So while we finish up the last slides, we invite you to uh, submit any questions you'd still like to have us answer. Um, bottom line, this is our bottom line slide. <laughs> bottom line is you can have policies that don't get enacted or, or you can have pockets of teachers doing things where other people are still digging in and resisting. We know this happens. But the bottom line is the classroom. 
you should be able to look at any CBE classroom and ask yourself, how, how does the teacher allow students to move forward at their own pace without stopping the learning? In other words, what's moving each student along? That's about access and opportunity. Um, wh when do all of the students need the same instruction? And when are those mini lessons the most useful? When do we give kids choices? For example, learning menus or station rotation types of activities. So there are comparable activities, but students are doing different activities. They're choosing, they're investing, they're owning it. Um, how do students understand what evidence they're being judged on? I still remember speaking with a student in Rhode Island several years ago. Um, they had built virtual um, digital portfolios of their artwork. And I asked the student, how do you decide what to put into the portfolio? And he explained that some other things he had put in there were from his freshman and sophomore years when he took art classes. But he felt that the art now represented a higher level of more sophisticated skills. So he was replacing them. He knew why he was replacing those things. He was saying, this best represents who I am as an artist now. I think there ought to be those opportunities for students to have conferences with peers, conferences with teachers to decide what is the body of evidence that best represents my consistent performance? This can't happen if the classroom culture doesn't provide students giving feedback, getting feedback, feeling comfortable with that feedback. Uh, a lot of, I think, what teachers are finding with the virtual teaching is how to have students use something like Flipgrid to give each other feedback, to critique, that has to be modeled, bef uh, yeah, thank Dan. <laughs> but that has to be modeled and practiced and reinforced. And so um, we're just about done with our time. Um, we can go to that next slide. So we invite you to do um, a deeper dive with us on November 10th. We'll have two hours. We will go more in depth on how to examine your competencies for rigor how to build performance tasks. And we've also built a CBE website um, so that you could use, it's by chapter, you could use the website for your own internal discussions. This presentation obviously will be posted by Aurora. Our individual websites have a multitude of um, resources as well, um, posted in different places. So. Um, what we'd, what we'd love to do is to be able to say, this was an overview, this was an introduction. Um, if you'd like to go deeper, we've designed the book as, as a guide for you to um, facilitate your own learning. And thank you, <laughs> thank you, Gail. <laughs> um, I see that um, people are commenting that they appreciate um, the resources. What we've all learned is when a teacher sees a good model, they can design a better one that will work in their own school. And so we're all about many different ways to uh, achieve the results. I also posted that, I put that link to that Google site. Thank you, that. Dan. And um, so we've got just a couple of minutes if there are any questions that we can answer. I know they're probably questions that can't be answered in a couple minutes, but. Many well, of the tools that we have in the book also were co-developed with teachers. That's that's how we we made those tools work for us over time uh, was with, with the input from teachers. And and uh, so the toolkit as part of the book is a, a good rich re resource in itself and it's all downloadable through Core One. Um. The, the question that came up earlier, I will just re, I, I wonder about the overall shift in mindset in which teachers and in parents can consider how competencies rather than arbitrary grades can actually reflect student learning. And I think, I think I came um, after your, your uh, presentation, Karen. So okay. I think it was sharing what you shared, but looking at it more through the shifting of mindsets for all shareholders. I believe that's the question, Candace, if that is. Or not yeah. 
Well, I think any school that's moved towards standards-based grading has learned, and I, my, I've worked in a couple of school districts that did that quite a few years ago. That, that's a shock to parents who know A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. F, and it's a brand new experience. So um, I think there's a teaching component as you move and shift the minds. Mm -hmm. I think parents have to actually see products, student products. This is what um, it looks like when you're, when you're a good writer. We've done that in the past, but we haven't always said, this is what a good mathematical argument might look like for a second grader. This is what a good student-led investigation might look like in social studies. So um, it's important to show parents the work that's represented. Just like in the CTE school, parents can understand the difference between an auto tech person who can change your tire and an auto tech person who can diagnose a problem and, and understand what the what is causing a problem. And, and that's where we have to have a better understanding of what, it, what these tasks look like when they become more sophisticated. Um, thank you for the comment about using my DOK model. All of the DOK um, matrices are posted on my website. They're also in, incorporated in the deeper competency-based learning book. And we talk a lot about how to break down competencies and performance scales by DOK level as well. So um, checking my time. Oh. I also, yeah, I also think that when you're moving away from that traditional structure, I think it's okay to call out the, the like what, what has worked. I can remember standing in front of my parents saying, I can remember going home and we, had a first, we found out who teacher, who had what teacher. And I'm sitting there saying, well, I have Miss Hess. Mm -hmm. And my buddy has Miss Colby. And I'm bumming because I got Miss Hess. <laughs> Of and, course. And I said, okay. Because so I made you work your butt off, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> she made me where I am today. But the point <laughs> being is why have standards? And then you can ask questions. That should it matter what teacher or student had? Yeah. Does it? Yeah. I think there's, there's, a real, there's a real honest way to look at the way we've always done things. And then as a principal, I'd say, boy, we worked really, really hard for this much gain. Yeah. And that's when we started to work with reinventing schools. Yeah. And I, I think a big no, thing too, Dan, is, is um, what we've learned over these last couple months with this remote learning, that parents are seeing the work that we're asking kids to do. And so they, they go into a, you know, a, a 40 minute math block and it takes their, their daughter 10 minutes to do the math. And the parents say, well, now what are you going to do for the rest of the time? Well, if, if she was learning in school, she would have finished it in 10 minutes, but had to wait around for another half hour for the rest of the class to get done. So it's really kind of bringing a, a level of awareness around the need to look at things differently, okay? And we, we need to capitalize on that. It's a great time to do it. And we have one minute left. And I believe Nikki has um, a poll that they would like you to um, take. And I believe Nikki's gonna, oh, there it oh, is. She just put it up. She's right there. <laughs> um, so, on behalf of all of us, looking forward to seeing you November 10th. Mm -hmm. um, please reach out to us if you have any questions and we appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>